Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. God zal je dingen zeggen die mogelijk zijn voor je. But you, when you read the word, you have to take it that it's for you. Not just that it's for this special group of some special people, but every promise in the word is for you. They're all for you. God wants to bless you. God wants to promote you. God wants to raise you up. God wants to use you. God wants to heal you. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 20 and I said to you you have come to the hill country of the Ammonites which the Lord your God gives us this is Moses saying this behold the Lord your God has set the land before you go up and possess it and the Lord the God of your fathers has said to you fear not neither be dismayed then you all came near to me and said let us send men before us that they may search out the land that they may bring us word again by which way we should go up and into what cities we shall come. And the thing pleased me well, and I took 12 men of you, and I sent you in. These are what we call the 12 spies who went in to check out the promised land. And sure enough, verse 25 says, they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us and brought us word again and said, it is a good land which the Lord your God gives us. Watch verse 26, yet you would not go up. <laughs> But you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. Now, I don't have time to go through all this, but later they decided, well, now we will go up. And God said, no, don't try to go in now because now I'm not with you. You should have went when I told you to. And so then they were on the border of the promised land when God told them, now's the time to go in and possess the land. They would not go in. They rebelled against the Lord and they wandered around for another 38 years out in the wilderness and many of them died out there. Now I want to teach you a little lesson tonight. When God tells you it's time to deal with something, <laughs> when God tells you it's time to deal with something, then there's an anointing on it to deal with it then. And you can't put it off till a more convenient time or a time when you think it's going to be easier or a time when you feel like you're ready because then you may decide, well, you know, I'm really tired of putting up with this. I think I'll deal with it now. Well, you might find that God's not got that anointing on you at that time. We have to learn when God touches things in our life that we need to take it seriously. If you know God's dealing with you about a bad attitude, then deal with it. If you know God's dealing with you about unforgiveness in your heart, then deal with it. Don't make some silly excuse about how hard it is to forgive people. I'll tell you what's hard, hating people. That is much harder than forgiving people. Forgiveness is easy compared to hatred and bitterness and resentment and being full of that poison all the time. If God is dealing with you about a habit that you have, that is a destructive habit, if God is putting his finger on it, then you do not have to even think that you can't do it because God is never going to deal with you about something without giving you the ability to go all the way through to victory. But you got to believe it. I was sexually abused by my dad for many years, and when I walked away from his home, I thought I walked away from the problem. Little did I know that I had the problem with me etched in my soul. It was in my mind, it was in my emotions, it was in my will, and it affected every relationship that I had, my relationship with God, my relationship with me, and my relationship with other people. Your secrets will make you sick. And when God begins to say it's time to deal with things, then it's time to deal with things. Well, my first marriage was a, a nightmare. I married a guy that had as many problems as I did, if not more, and he ran around with other women and was a petty thief and a con man. And, so that never worked out. Five years of that nightmare, had one child and finally ended up getting a divorce. He went to prison and met Dave who was born again, a Holy Ghost filled Lutheran young man. I told you last night, wanting a wife, praying for a wife. He was dating three women. He was trying to, he was trying to possess the land. 
He had a... <laughs> He could, he could see it with the eye of faith, and he was going out to take it, let me tell you. So, <laughs> and he, he knew none of the three was dating was right, and so he saw me washing my mother's car outside my house, thought I was cute, had on short shorts, my hair piled on top of my head, <laughs> probably smoking my cigarette and drinking my beer or whatever. And, and, uh, he said, hey, you want to wash my car when you're finished with that one? I said, if you want your car washed, buddy, wash it yourself. <laughs> and he said, the thing that came to him was, that's the girl for me. <laughs> now, he was obviously either demented or he was being led by the Spirit of God. <laughs> David only had five dates and got married. I mean, he had to, he had to move fast before he figured out what he was getting. So we got married, about three weeks later, Dave looked at me and said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> well, see, I didn't know I had a problem. I thought everybody else was the problem. I didn't know I had a problem. And maybe that's your problem that you don't know that you're the problem. I see you watching through that TV screen. I said, maybe that's your problem that you don't know that you're the problem. You thought I was just talking to all these pretty people here in this conference, but I'm not, I'm talking to you. Matter of fact, I'm doing this whole thing mainly for you. Gotcha. You don't just get to lay there in your bed with your remote in your hand and don't you try to flip the channel either because I'll be on another channel. You can't get away from me in the morning. If you're going to watch TV, you're going to find me. <laughs> and so, I didn't know I had all these problems. Well, Dave and I went to church. You know, we, he loved God. I loved God. I believed in Jesus. I was born again. But I wasn't dealing with my issues. So one night, Dave and I went to a church service, and there was a woman there giving a testimony who had been sexually abused by her father. Her story was so closely linked to mine that it was scary. She kind of handled her problems in a different way than I did. She went on to become a prostitute and had a whole lot of problems, and then she met a godly man and talked about how God dealt with her and how she'd been healed. Well, she'd written a book, and... Dave bought me the book because by now he knew that I'd been abused. I shared with him what had happened to me. And uh, he gave me the book. And the next morning I opened the book up and I started to read her story. And what, as she explained the things her father had done to her, they were precisely what my dad had done to me. And I felt pain come roaring through my soul because you see, I had all that stuff neatly shut off behind closed doors and I wasn't dealing with it. And I threw the book across the room and I said, I am not gonna read this book. And I heard the Holy Ghost say so sweetly but so strongly, it's time. It's time. And maybe God would speak that to some of you tonight or some of you watching by TV or listening by a CD later on, it's time. It's time to stop going around and around and around the same mountains, blaming somebody else for all your problems, looking back at your past all the time with no positive vision for the future. Let me tell you again that no matter what has happened to you in your past, no matter what is going on in your life right now, it does not have the power to keep you from having a great life if you will have a positive vision for your future. The second wrong mindset that they had that I'd like to deal with is somebody else needs to do this for me. Today we call it an entitlement mentality. Somebody else needs to take care of this mess that I've made. Somebody else needs to do this. Not me, somebody else. It's called irresponsibility. And boy, do we have a mess with that in our world today. It's time to take responsibility. 
You say, well, what happened to me wasn't my fault. No, it probably wasn't. What happened to me wasn't my fault, but what I do about it is my responsibility. And what you do about it is your responsibility. Come on now. It was not my fault that my father sexually abused me. That was not my fault. That was not my responsibility. But it was my responsibility to take hold of the Word of God that I said I believed. And to quit whining and feeling sorry for myself and looking back at the past and having a bad attitude. That was my responsibility. It wasn't just something that I had to expect somebody else to come along and miraculously do for me. I needed to start obeying God and do what He wanted me to do. In Matthew 20, 16, the Bible says, many are called and few are chosen. Many are called and few are chosen. I believe many people are called to do great, great, amazing things. I really think that the world should be amazed at Christians. I really do. I think that we should be the world's heroes. People need heroes. They need somebody to look up to. They need somebody to admire, somebody to point them in the right direction. Every little kid loves to play superheroes. My two youngest grandsons have every superhero costume that you can possibly have. I now even have one so I can play superheroes with them. <laughs> I have my own superhero cape. It has a big J on the back of it with a lightning bolt through it. <laughs> if we provided the world with an example of Jesus, they would be encouraged and given hope. Many are called, few are chosen. Many are called to do great things, but few do great things. Why? Because very few will take the responsibility for the call. It doesn't end with a call. That's where the work starts. <laughs> First comes the call, then comes the work, then comes the sacrifice, then comes the never giving up, then comes the going all the way through. A lot of people are called to do great things, but we have a wrong mindset. We have a wrong mentality about what God's asking us to do. Everybody has equal opportunity. Everybody has all of the power of God available to them, but not everybody is willing to do their part. One of the things we cannot delegate, and I am a great delegator, but you cannot delegate personal responsibility. Amen? Now, in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and you'll find a lot of these same things, most of these things that I'm talking to you about, you're going to find in this book. This is chapter 17, Wilderness Mentality number 2. Somebody do it for me. I don't want to take the responsibility. And in Joshua 1, 1 through 3, we see... that the Bible says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, who was Moses' minister, Moses, my servant, is dead. <laughs> well, that's a very interesting statement because if you really know what went on before this, it was like, why in the world would God say Moses is dead? Joshua well knew Moses was dead. They'd already been mourning Moses for 30 days. So why come along and say Moses is dead? Because there was something inferred in the statement that is not made plain on the printed page. And what was inferred was it's now time for you to take new responsibility. Because you see, Moses did everything for the Israelites. He even did their repenting. They didn't even repent of their own sins. When they would act dumb and sin, Moses would go get on his face and beg God not to kill him. And I think that we need to realize tonight that perhaps some of the old ways that we have done things are dead. And this is a new day. And God's saying, it is now time to deal with stuff 
It is now time to step up into a new level of responsibility. It is now time to stop putting things off till another more convenient time. Now is the time. Amen? How many of you don't want to go around and around the same stupid mountain one more time? All right, well, if you don't want to go around it, there's only one thing left to do, and that's go through it. The only way out is through. Did you hear me? The only way out is through. Moses is dead. So now arise. That means get up and get going. So now arise, take his place, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land which I am giving to them, the Israelites. And I love, 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 love this. And every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I already given unto you. Wow. Does anybody see what that's saying? There is so much still out in front of me in my life that I see with the eye of faith but I cannot possess it just standing on the border of the promised land, moaning and mourning about how difficult it is. God's already paid for it with the blood of his son. It's already been bought and purchased. Now he said, you go in and take it. Every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I already given unto you. Amen. I can't just stand over here and say, well, somebody else do it for me. Can't I just pray this in? Oh, man, we need to pray. But you know what happens a lot of times when you pray, God goes and shows you something to do. Uh-oh. Let me say it again. Sometimes when you pray, God go shows you something to do. So then we pray again, hoping we'll get another selection. <laughs> oh God, why I don't, what, what happened to my joy? God, I don't know why I'm so unhappy. And then all of a sudden, you remember that you really treated somebody bad. And God's saying, now you need to go apologize. You need to humble yourself and tell them you were wrong and make it right. Well, I'm, I, I can't bear, I'm, 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 I'm. See, when you pray, God shows you things. The Bible says, look at the ant. Having no chief and no overseer, it still works hard and does what's right. I love people that will do what's right without anybody making them do what's right. Can you manage yourself? Are you a self-starter? Are you somebody that will do what's right when nobody is looking? Or will you only do what's right and what you need to do when somebody's making you? I had a brother like that, and I say I had a brother because he's no longer with us. 10 years younger than me, my only sibling. Early in his life, because of a lot of the things that we were going through, he joined the Marines when he was 17, was in the Vietnam War, got addicted to drugs, and never really got all right in his life. We tried and tried to help him. He even lived with Dave and I for a long time, and as long as I would get him up to go to work, he'd go to work. As long as I would tell him what to do, he'd do it. If we'd sit down and study the Bible with him, he'd study. But anytime he got on his own, he couldn't manage himself, and he'd go right back to where he was at. And sadly, very sadly, my brother, who could have been part of this, traveled the world, helped people all around the globe, ended up dying in an abandoned building in Los Angeles about three years ago, right around Christmas time. Doesn't matter who your family is, just because his sister was a, a TV preacher and an evangelist and helping people all over the world, that didn't count for him. He had to take his responsibility. You can't get by on secondhand faith. It doesn't matter what your mama believes. You got to find out what you believe. Amen. Somebody else can't do it for you. 
it's time for you to get some starch and stand up and say, I'm going to possess the land that Jesus died to give me. If anybody can have what Jesus died to give them, I'm going to have what Jesus died to give me. There's so many wonderful things in the Word of God that teach us what God wants us to have. And you cannot have an attitude that somebody else needs to do it all for you. The happiest people in the world are the most active people in the world. Honestly and truly, I don't know what kind of problems I got. I don't have time to think about them. I mean, if I wanted to sit down and figure it out, I could probably name you 10 right now, but I don't, I don't time to mess with that. God says he'll take care of things, so we pray about them, we cast our care on him, and stay busy helping somebody else, and somehow or another, it just works itself out. You know what's been an amazing thing to me? Sometimes when God will not anoint me to solve my own problem, I mean, I cannot help myself. There's not one thing I can do to help myself in a situation I'm in. He will anoint me to go help somebody else. I kind of think that it sounds like a God thing. When you can't help yourself, you can go sow into somebody else's life and then God will bring a harvest in your life. Life is just too hard. <laughs> it's just too hard. Just too hard. I'm so tired of hearing people say that. It's just too hard to forgive. Please make everything easy, pardon me, Lord. I just can't take it if things are too hard. It's not going to work. Deuteronomy 30, 11. For this commandment which I command you this day is not too difficult for you, <laughs> nor is it far off. This commandment which I command you is not too hard for you. Can you say tonight, anything that God asks me to do, I can do it. See, some of you wouldn't even bother to say it. Everybody say, anything God asks me to do, I can do it. Nothing's too hard with God. All things are possible with God. But the devil whispers in your ear, tries to put a wrong thought in your mind. This is never going to change. This is not going to change. This has been going on 20 years. It ain't going to change. You might as well forget it. Nothing good's ever going to happen to you. That's when you just need to say, I'm not giving up. Learn how to say, I am not giving up. You really have nothing else to do other than press on. What else are you going to do? John Wesley, the wonderful, amazing John Wesley, that we hear so much about and admire. Here is an actual excerpt from his own diary. Sunday, May the 5th, AM. Preached in St. Anne's and was asked not to ever come back. <laughs> Sunday, PM, May the 5th. Preached at St. John's and the deacon said, get out and stay out. <laughs> Sunday, May the 12th in the AM. Preached at St. Jude's, can't go back there either. <laughs> May the 19th, Sunday a.m. Preached at another church, deacons called a special meeting and said I could never return. Sunday p.m., May the 19th, preached on the street, got kicked off the street. <laughs> Sunday a.m., May the 26th, preached in a meadow, chased out of the meadow by a bull who was turned loose during the service. <laughs> Even the bull got after him. Sunday a.m., June the 2nd, preached out on the edge of town and got kicked off the highway. Same day, June the 2nd, Sunday p.m., in the afternoon, preached in a pasture, 10,000 people came out to hear me. Yes! Why? Just because he said, I'm going to just keep preaching. You're not going to shut me up? You're not going to make me quit? I tell you what, to endure, and the Bible does talk a lot about endurance, 
I believe means to outlast the devil. Well, I'd like to share something with you that came in by email. Carl writes in from Wisconsin and says, by the time I was in the ninth grade, I was running from life's difficulties. Kids picked on me at school because I was small. My grandpa had given me my first drink at the age of nine, so I quickly fell into addiction and landed in prison for seven months. Years later, I saw Joyce speak at a conference and have listened to her program ever since. I have learned how amazing a Christian life is when you walk in the fruit of the Spirit and study the Word of God as a way of life. And I'm emphasizing that, studying the Word of God as a way of life. You know, to, remove, to renew your mind is to forget your past and put your spiritual eyes on and begin to start walking in the Word of God.